Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Great Trees and Women's Temple. Um, our speaker this morning is Meredith Moyong McIntosh. Um, there it's Sage. <laughs> did not want to start without her. She had to pee. Uh, <laughs> they can't see you. Oh, that's okay. You disembody. Come on, get over here. They can't see me anyway. She's pinned. Well, they can. Oh, okay. <laughs> would you would you do the opening sutra for us then? Why doesn't everybody come up here? So she can see us. <clears throat> Sorry, Maria. An unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect Dharma is rarely met with in a hundred thousand kalpas. Having it to see and listen to. Remember and accept. I vow to taste the truth of Zadastagata's teaching. In Buddhism, when Zen practitioners share their understanding of the teachings and practice, it is freely offered as a practice of dana paramita. Dana is a Pali word that means generosity or to give freely. And this practice is done without expectation of getting something in return. This is the spirit about preaching, preaching uh, about the Dharma. Other ways to practice Dana is to offer support to those who share the teachings, to support places of spiritual practice, and to give without judgment or expectation when opportunity arises. Those who do share the teachings at Great Tree do so on a Dana basis. Please support their practice by giving what you can. And Meredith, do you have a place you'd like us to uh, give Donna? Should I put it in the chat? Yes. Sure. Yes. Sounds good. Meredith brings the practice of Zazen to a lifetime of music training and playing and a 40 plus year interest in body mind awareness. Since 1988, she has been a student of the late Tanjen Harada, Roshi of Bukuku Kokuji, Bukokuji in Obama, Obama? <laughs> Japan, and has traveled there several times for extended practice. With the fabric of Zazen underlying all aspects of her life, Meredith finds it profoundly helpful to study, practice, and teach the principles common to the Alexander Technique and the Dharma. Welcome, Meredith. Thank you. All right. Is that in the chat? Did that go? Um, I, I don't see it. Okay. I need to send it, maybe. There it is. We got it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can you copy the chat? You don't have to. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I have a cold and there's some stuff in my vocal cords, so I have kind of squeaky voice and sometimes no voice at all. So we'll see how it goes. I'm drinking a cup of throat coat, so hopefully. <laughs> um, those of you that have been at retreats with me and Tejo, um, or just me, uh, this phrase, be like a blade of grass, is nothing new. Um, but I always like the image, and it helps me, it reminds me of um, the fact that there are, it almost seems like oppositional um, in a good way, forces that come together in an overall coordinated sense of grace and poise. And so the blade of grass, um, if you look at a blade of grass, I just went out and picked one. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it has a pretty thick spine in the middle and then some other fibrous 
things on each side. And in this case, it's cold and it's kind of limp, but in on a good day, and it's very long, it hasn't been cut. But um, it has some tinsel strength in the middle, like a spine. It is ex really like a spine. And that's what is in the center, um, basically allowing it to be coming up from the ground. And then basically just being there. And when a breeze comes through, it it responds. It doesn't care whether a breeze comes through or or whether there's no breeze at all. If there's no breeze at all, it simply is there. But it's both upright and not held. And it has no preferences. Again, if a breeze comes through, then it will move and it'll settle back down after the breeze is gone. So I feel like that's a good lesson for us, all of us. Um, we have spines and it's, it's not just our bony spine, we have muscles that um, act with the spine in our center that are our uprightness. And there are reflexes in our coordination that are there if we call on them to be that upright support for us. And then just as the blade of grass, um, we also have some movability. It's not just a metal pole, like the blade of grass, it's not a metal pole, it's very sturdy, but it moves. And this is the quality with which we can also find ourselves, but often give up. Um, we either give up one or the other. We, many people often give up the upright support in just a slump. And why don't you just take a, a slump, which is, we know what that is. And then think of your spine and let it lengthen up from the very top joint down to the tailbone. Just let it lengthen back out into uprightness. And so we give sometimes give that up. The other way we give up the coordination is by saying, oh, I don't want to do that. That's bad. So what I want to do is be not slumped. So we, we lift ourselves up and into a holding. And this is what I find a lot of times with meditators because we're trying to be upright and we let go of the not held part. So let's think about, we came up from our slump and just check in with yourself. You can close your eyes or just sense yourself in coming up to your upright place. Mm -hmm. Did you gather yourself in? Did you tighten your neck to become upright? Did you give up some of the not held? And if you did, see if you can find your sit bones on the chair and let your curves of your spine be in their lengthened place and then let, let go of anything that gathered you in to be holding upright. 
And maybe take a breath there. So those two things are in play. Um, just to let us picture a little bit, um, let me see, let me, you can let me know if I'm not holding this right for you to be able to see. It's okay. Okay. So here is our spine under these muscles and along that spine this this right here right in here is our sacrum yeah inside or the outside it's a post it's the back view of the outside okay so this is what if you put your hand back on your, you know, just above your tailbone, that flat bone, that, you're putting your hand on this, the sacrum. And then your tailbone comes down from there. So that's the lowest part of our spine. And our spine's coming up through all of our, past our ribs, through our upper ribs, through our neck, and all the way up to the top joint. And the top joint is behind your nose, at your ear level. Just see if you can't, uh, you know, just play with that little bit. Of, Think of the behind your nose, the level of the flaps of the little flaps of your ears, right centrally or oriented. That's your top joint. So if we look at our muscles as the blade of grass, we see that our spine is in the center of that. And then those supportive muscles are along the muscles. Some of them are very long. Some of them are just little ones that keep adding on. And together, those are like, those are like the blade of grass. If we are allowing for that upright sense of support from our sit bones on the chair all the way up to the top joint. And then checking whether we can let something go on top of that uprightness. Then we get into a place where if you give yourself a little waggle or even bounce your legs up and down, it might be hard for you people that are on the cushions, but just bounce your knees up and down. Then we get a sense of upright, but not held. Does that make sense to most of you or all of you? Cross fingers. <laughs> <coughs> All right, then. If we think of sitting in Zazen and we go through these little thoughts of upright but not held, and as we're sitting down, we've learned from Teja that we can rock side to side. You know, then smaller and smaller, and then just your head. And get, you know, allowing for that, the blade of grass kind of sensation of movability 
And then we come to just sitting and not moving. Can you understand that being here for 30, 40 minutes is possible? It looks like I'm not moving and I'm choosing not to move. But if someone bumped into me, I would respond like a blade of grass, or I hope to. I, I would hope that for myself. Um, it's almost inevitable that sometime during a long period of sitting that we become a little bit gathered in either by way of our physicality. Um, I can't really explain why. Um, but every now and then, I notice that I might have gathered myself in a little bit. And if I, if I do notice, I just go let it go and then renew my movability on top of my uprightness. So that is all possible with us. The other way, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, that we become drawn in. Oh, who can guess? Who can guess the other reason? Oh, noggin. <laughs> The noggin. We have our our things, you know. And we're like, oh, you know. Um, and we've learned in uh, from Tejo and all of our thoughts of sitting that we intend to notice them and just let them go on, but sometimes they don't. So if that's the case, and thoughts are inseparable from how your body is, inseparable, how could they be separated? They are part of our chemistry. The brain is changing its chemicals based on what thoughts coming in, and it affects us. So if we've gathered ourselves in by way of, oh, you know, or, oh, I'm not going to think. I'm really not going to think. Oh, I'm really not going to think this time. This, this one's going to be a good one. <laughs> well, what have we done? We've gathered ourselves in, you know, again. That's fine. It's, it's natural. As I think it, uh, Katagiri Roshi used to say, and I've learned this by way of Tejo, that the brain, it just it's normal that it has secretions. And those chemical secretions, we, in our lay word, we call thoughts. And if you found that, just as we did with, oh, I've gathered myself in kind of in a physical way, and here I am, I let that go. If they've if we've gathered our bodies in by through our mind monkey business, then as soon as you notice it, there's no nothing wrong or you didn't do something bad, but just be willing to at that moment poop, let it go. And in doing so, see if you can't again, come back to that sense. Oh, I'm letting that thought go. How can it be let go in my body? And there you are again, upright, but not held. So I want to do a little experiment 
Oh, let me show you one other thing for muscles. Um, and then I'll, we'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. I didn't point this out on this one, but where this stops, or it's a detailed view right here of the top of the spine. And that's the skull, the bottom of the skull drawn in. So those muscles continue all the way up the spine and they become smaller and smaller and many crisscrosses in the neck, um, in the neck muscles. And then here's an even more detailed version. Look at how all the crisscrossed and layered muscles come in to support the neck. So talk about blades of grass, talk about movability with support. It's amazing. And then one other thing that I would like to add muscle wise is our the way our legs are attaching to our torso so this one i'm going to have to keep going up and down because it's very long and i'll orient you to what we're looking at This is our spine, and it's fairly far up our spine. And then this muscle attaches to various other vertebra. And this right here is our iliac crest, what we can put our hands on when we're you know, when we're just saying, oh, I'm going to put my hands. When we're little, we call it, I'm putting my hands on my waist. Well, it, we don't have a waist. So anyway, but that's what we're looking at here. That's the big iliac crest. That is the upper part of the pelvis. And this muscle continues on down. This is on the inside. And it continues on down. Here is the, this is the sit bone. You, when you sit on a chair, you can feel that sit bone. That's the lower curve of the pelvis. And this mu muscle keeps continuing on down. And it attaches onto the inside of our leg. Here's the, hip joint, and this is the femur, which is a, the upper leg bone. So that muscle attaches our leg, goes upright through our pelvis, starts attaching onto various lower vertebra, and keeps attaching up, 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 up onto our spine. This is one of the upper, lower back spine. This is called the psoas. We've all heard that at the gym. So that's our upright support for our legs, our knees, feet on the ground when we're walking. And we have another one. I'll just show this to you briefly. This, um, the ilia, iliacus, it's, it's, the, it's one that fans out and um, basically attaches onto the inside of that iliac, of the pelvis. And it attaches onto the inside, and it also then attaches onto the leg bone. 
So we are really like a blade of grass. These muscles are upright, supportive, and yet they can help us literally walk and be movable. Um, maybe, maybe I'll take any comments and questions for a, a moment. Um, I'm going to go get a little bit more hot water. And so I'll be right back. All right, anybody have any comments or questions, something that's confusing? How does the breath relate? Um, you mentioned our thoughts relating to our muscles. How does our breath relate? The breath is... Um, it's... It's actually a really good part of that system of support and movability because the lungs are inside the rib cage. The ribs are all attached onto the spine. And our diaphragm, which is the major actor of our breath, is attached in a very unique way. I won't have time to go into that, but it's attached into the spinal area. So the whole breathing coordination is the same theme of support and movability. The lungs, um, when the brain gets a signal that oxygen, the blood level of oxygen is needs to be replenished, the diaphragm starts to descend and that gives more room. And as a response, it sort of happens very quickly, one all together, one after the other. Then the lungs start to expand in every direction like a balloon. And they're very big, you know, they're very big. And so that, um, that, uh, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, the lungs start to expand. Well, they will only expand to the degree that the ribs will move out of the way. And the ribs are attached onto the spine. And the ribs will move out of out of the way to the de to, to the degree with which the muscles are movable. So if not not the deeper muscles, they're still with the spine, but our outer muscles, which we haven't really talked about. Um, if if we are upright and held, then our muscles are holding our ribs, our ribs are holding our lungs, and the, then the lungs go. And then they don't have a full breath, inhale or exhale, and then the oxygen doesn't get replenished as fully as it could be. And then, um, you know, that affects our thinking and our being and everything. So in a way, it's, it's along the same theme. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? 
Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know that how belly breathing is always kind of suggested in for zazen. And what I've heard is that when you breathe into your belly, which you can't really breathe into your belly, but when you expand your belly, that it it you get more oxygen all the way down to the bottom of your lungs. Um, but when you talk about when you tell us about breathing, you're talking you you talk about that expanding outward. And I'm just wondering, what do you think about uh, the effect of the belly breathing? And do you have any other comments about that? Yes, I um, I understand why such a movement would be that it would be observed in the body when someone's breathing, and it would be observed quite easily and therefore interpreted as oh that's what's breathing and so uh people that are interested in putting names to things then would call it a belly breath i don't agree with taking it out of the actual truth of what's happening when you're breathing and I don't think it's necessary to because that's going to be happening. When the diaphragm descends, it's up here at the sternum. And when it descends on the inhale, it descends way down in the belly and it flattens out. It just flattens out like a pancake. But it's attached all the way around the lower ribs. So it descends and then the ribs are going out and it's blah, going down. What it does is that it displaces the space where the colon, the small intestines, large intestines, all the organs, it displaces it. It leaves less room for those things. So what where do they go? They just pooch out a little bit for for that time. And then they come back in when the diaphragm descends, I mean ascends on the exhale. So inhale, why don't we all do this just to get this a little bit clearer? We're going to have our fingers, you know, like clasped together, but be sure there's a, a dome on the inside. And then put it, let me see if I can get this farther away. Put it by your sternum, which is that long plate in between your breasts. At the bottom of your sternum, put your dome. All right, so on your next inhale, you're going to start lowering your hands and flattening them out all the way down to, so your thumbs are sort of catching in your navel and really flatten them out, flatten your hands out. That's inhale. Exhale, it, it ascends up again. Inhale, and exhale. And now just add on, noticing what your ribs are doing while you're doing that. Inhale, descends, your ribs are swinging out. Exhale, ascend, and your ribs are draping down toward the spine. So in my way of um, wanting to understand things, I would rather just observe my belly 
coming out and understand more how the breathing coordination is working. Also, um, checking myself if I'm holding anything. And so my ribs are going to be coming out. My lungs are going to have more room to expand. My diaphragm is going to descend more fully. And then I'll be getting more of a breath. My my um, belly will maybe pooch out a little bit more. And then it will come back in when I exhale. So, you know, I don't know. That's, I would rather follow what I know to be true anatomically. And I know that uh, singers, they learn lots of different controls with belly. So there may be a, a, a reason for calling it something else and controlling it in a different way. But right this morning that this is my answer for Thank your you. question, Teja. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was my understanding that when we do deep belly breathing, our parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system gets triggered to help us relax. But where exactly is that? Is that in, like I've always heard we have a little neurological system in our gut, but is that in our stomach? Is that in our, is it that? The yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question, and um, I would like to answer it, but um, I'd have to do some research because, <laughs> as you say, there may be something that, that gets triggered um, on the other end, like starting with your belly, and that would affect the diaphragm, you know. So I, that's why I finished my answer to Teja with, with, there may be other ways. I just, this is how I understand things. So if you actually, do you happen to know the answer or you, it would be good to find that out. Um, I don't know. The, no, I don't know the answer. I just, okay. I've read that, yeah, it's a sim. I mean, it's not obviously like our brain, but it's like a little bitty brain. And our I've always heard gut, and I didn't do any more research past gut, which can mean so uh -huh. many. But supposedly, when you do deep breathing and exhale a little longer than you inhale, then it does trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. Well, I would agree with that, and. Um... I think that whatever you're saying would be going on in the way that I described the breathing anatomically. I, I think that would be happening. Um, but it may be able to be initiated by starting with moving the belly. I don't know. What I do know is that when the ox, when I'll just review, uh, when the brain senses it needs to up the oxygen level in the blood, that's when the diaphragm starts to descend. Not because someone made their belly start, in, in a, in, you know, even if they're calling it belly breathing, it's still happening by way of the diaphragm initiating that whole breathing coordination but it all happens so instantly together um Corinne. i have i have a quick question um when we were doing the exercise with the diaphragm i mean basically is that as much of a difference it looked like a lot your diaphragm goes up and down a lot is that true about how much it does move. 
um, maybe it's not quite as big as it looks when we're doing that exercise, but it it does have a fairly big, I'm, I'm going to say like maybe four inches, something like that. It does definitely have a big, big, um, you know, travel. Thank and you. It, and it can be bigger if we are breathing more fully. Thank you. And in all, all breathing things, it is true that we often shortchange the exhale. So um, it's good to be mindful of that and try to let your exhale be a little bit longer when you're aware of it. Meredith, can can you say more about um, uh, not holding versus kind of slumping? I think sometimes I um, am not sure if I'm not holding or if I'm slumping, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little, it's kind of a little trick. And so we'll do it that way um, at first. Um, just in your places, come to upright as what whatever your upright is. And find your top joint right up there behind your nose. And then see if you can even like come up further from there, not taking yourself off your cushion, but just still lengthen, lengthen, lengthen. Maybe it almost feels like a straightening of the back of your neck just as tall as you can possibly make yourself. And then from there, see if you have a sensation of holding yourself. And if you do, see if you can't, like right now, I let my butt muscles go and some of my muscles around my ribs I let go and my there was a little bit of shoulder stuff I let go and the back of my neck I let go but I'm still fairly upright but not pulling myself up can you feel the difference mm -hmm. Trey can you feel the difference I can yeah I noticed for me, it was kind of my mid upper back was gathered. Often we, when we come trying to get in our zazen places, uh, you know, our upright posture, I see this a lot. Uh, in we think we're coming up here, but we think we need to overarch right here. We think that is coming up, but it's actually narrowing our middle back. So what needs to happen there is <coughs> Is that uh -huh, this is too hot. our our ri ribs in the front are kind of overarched, so we need to just let them drop so that our middle back, instead of being here, our middle back is resting and widening. Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Thank you. That's a very um, common habit in our in us meditators. So um, does this all start to make sense for the title of the talk? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different ways we could um, you look at our feet and see that same, you know, support but not held um someone asked about breathing and we could see that that is also in place upright but not held um yeah and um there there seems to be like like you know, especially when you look around the world at people, there seems to be like a lot of habit in how we deal with our spines. And then when we sit down like now to think about it, it's, it's really helpful. But I just wonder if, how do you cross that um, or how do you take along with you the consciousness about what's going on and what's helpful as opposed to your habits? Million dollar question there, Ann. <laughs> um, I think we all have all of it all the time. We have the ability to make choices at any time. We have the ability to notice a habit and then pause and make a different choice. So It's extremely difficult to not be run by our habits pretty much all the time. Either our habits of thinking, our habits of responding emotionally or physically. Um, habits are Many of our habits are good. We don't have to learn to walk every day, you know, because we have many, many good habits that are serving us well. Um, there is no difference between ourselves as we're sitting here this morning um, and thinking about these things and the people that are gonna turn their cameras off in, in a little while, in a couple minutes, and then going about our day. It's still the same spine. It's still the same responsibility. Responsibility. Um, but because our habits are so normalized it's what you know we don't notice them because it they're they're us that i really think um just as we you people that have come here have taken the time out to sit because you understand something about just sitting and shutting up and just observing, doing nothing, nothing special. Um, 
that seems crazy to some people that don't sit. Seems crazy to just sit and look at a wall. What? So you, in one sense, understand that taking yourself out of your habit and sitting down and just being is worthwhile. I would say that the same is true of understanding how our physical coordination, our ability to be upright and not held, our ability to notice our habits, our ability to make some changes and choices, um, need a little bit of dedicated time. So we actually need to spend a little bit of time, maybe not at our on our zazen cushions, maybe at our kitchen sinks, or maybe when you're sitting down, to just a little bit of time to, to think through some of these things, to sort of give yourself a little reminder. Oh, my ribs. Oh, what's upright not held, you know? to kind of explore these kind of things. I think it's the only way to let your brain redefine what, what it means to be sitting and, and not. If you don't take the time out to allow that retraining, that redefining um, to allow your explorer's mind to make some inroads like we have this morning. Your habit um, way of moving and way of thinking um, will just continue as it is. But the really good news is that um, being willing to take a little bit of time, in addition to your zazen, but just this kind of, how am I doing this zazen? What kind, with what kind of quality? What can I learn? What can I give myself when I'm getting ready to sit? Oh, I can be upright, not or even just practicing that separate from Zazen, I think is really just as valuable as coming to a retreat or having your sitting session at your house. Thank you. Um, we might be getting close to time. So I would, I guess I'll say thank you for coming. And if you have any burning questions, um, I don't know the woman's name who asked about the parasympathetic um, initiation of breath. Deborah. Deborah. Okay. Um, if I find something out, I'll pass it to Tejo. If you find something out, you pass it to Tejo. And then we'll hear yeah, that's very interesting now. All right, any other questions right here at the end here? I guess one last one is, I find after I sit for a while, I, like some people seem like they can just sit forever, but my back, even when I sway and move, I breathe, it, I still get tired and I've never, not gotten tired even when I was young and did sashims. I used to have to put my leg up during Dharma talks and and I don't know, maybe it's just my body structure. I'm tall, uh, but it just seems like I've never developed the ability just to sit, 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 sit with without being uh, mm -hmm. or, or it's almost I almost feel like I can't even breathe super well after I've been sitting a long time. Yeah, because you're trying to make do with yeah. how you feel. Yeah. And maybe um, that's 
maybe everyone feels that way. I don't know. But well, I, I people can sit forever. It seems like some some people can more than others. Um, I I think it's great that you just come and do your best. Thank you. That's <laughs> the way it is. Unless I was able to see you you know like in person or uh i don't even know who you are is that brooke or who, who is that my name is deborah deborah Step. um you know that there, there may be a few tips or this and that i think tall people it is harder um but i think your strategy of being okay with doing what you need to do in order to stay on your cushion, you know, I think that's, that's great. Um, yeah, so unless I could get together with you, I don't know how, I don't have any specific um, yeah. answers. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Meredith. This well, has been very helpful for me and I, looks like it has been helpful for other people too. So uh, again, I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. And yeah. I hope you're feeling better. I'm glad my voice carried on a bit. <laughs> <laughs> now you don't talk for the rest of the day, okay? <laughs> um, well, okay. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> That's my recommendation. May the merit of this practice May the merit of this practice benefit all beings, benefit all beings, and bring peace, and bring peace. So if anybody wants to join us for the next sitting, we'll be sitting from 11, we have Kinyin now, and we'll be sitting from 11.10 to 11.50, right? 11.50, so.